Hi, everybody. We are going to talk about chapter 11 today, confounding and obscuring variables. And specifically, this has to do with experiments and problems that might occur with experiments. So let's go ahead and start with a, uh, a question. This is a review question. Take a look at this scenario. So my hypothesis is that studying makes you happier. I measure everyone's happiness in January before the semester starts. And then I measure again after their last final when they've completed all of their studying. I found that they're happier. If you don't think that studying made them happier, that would be a problem with which one of these? That would be a problem with internal validity. So remember, inter internal validity is saying that, that, that you actually have the independent variable causing the change in the dependent variable. So if you don't think that studying causes happiness, then you are doubting the internal validity of this particular study. When we look at these studies, we need to think about, when we're thinking about problems, we need to think about problems for in rejecting the null versus failing to reject the null. So when you reject the null, you have potential problems with internal validity. So for example, if I go out there and say, I think that studying makes you happier, and this study that I just did where I measured your happiness in January, uh, and then I measure your happiness again after your last final, and turns out you're happier right after your last final, um, the, if you're saying, well, it wasn't because of studying that made you happy, it's because you're not stressed anymore, that's what made you happy, then you're doubting the internal validity. And we're gonna talk about potential problems with internal validity, remember, the problems with internal validity are coming when you reject the null. You have a separate set of problems when you fail to reject the null. When you fail to reject the null, you're saying, oh boy, there's really no difference between uh, people who study and those who don't study in terms of their happiness. Well, you might be making a type two error, which is that there really is a difference between those who study and those who don't study in terms of their happiness. But something about your study made it so that you could not find that. So the problems that happen when you reject the null, they might lead you to a type one error where you reject the null when you shouldn't have done that. The problems when you reject, when you fail to reject the null, those are problems that might lead you to a type two error and they're separate problems. So when we look at these problems, make sure you know, are these problems based off of rejecting the null or failing to reject the null? So let's go ahead and talk about a poor experiment. The experiment that I just explained to you where you have everybody measure their happiness in January and then right after the la their last final, that is a one group pretest post-test design and it's bad. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a within group. So you might say that, oh, this is actually a within groups design, but it's not a really, it's not a good one because there's no balance of orders, only one group, right? But the one group is everybody because they all do everything in exactly the same order, right? Or you think about it like a, like a independent groups design, except there's only one group, so they're not independent groups. Anyway, it's, it's, it's actually more like a within groups design, but you never vary the order and there's only one, uh, so that there's only one group. So in this case, what we did is we measured your happiness. That's like a pretest, okay? Then we had everybody during the semester, and we're assuming that they're studying more during that semester. And then after they're studying, right after their final, that's the post-test. Well, there's all sorts of problems with that, and you intuitively can figure those out. So what makes something a good experiment? Well, a good experiment makes sure we have the three criteria for causality, covariance, temporal precedence, and internal validity. So we're mainly gonna talk a lot about ideas of internal validity, but there are some other things that we need to talk about as well. Uh, problems with, with null effects have problems with the amount of covariance that's going on, for example. So let's go ahead and look at several of these. Now, these are threats to internal validity that specifically happen in within groups design. They happen when you repeat the measure, okay? You, you, you can do this technically in a pretest, post-test, but you're more likely to see it in like a within groups design, specifically one where you don't vary the order of presentation. So these are things that can lead you to reject the null hypothesis when you shouldn't have done that, right? They're threats to internal validity, specifically in within groups design, specifically things that happen over time. So let's think about our studying makes you happier example. All right. So remember, measure your happiness in January, 
then I'm assuming during the semester you study, then right after your last final, we measure your happiness again. Well, why would happiness change if it wasn't because of studying? That's the threat to internal validity that we're talking about. Because remember, I concluded that, you know, people are happier after they study. Well, there could be other reasons why. So for example, the first problem is maturation. Maturation is a natural change in the group. So for example, maybe it is that over a semester, people just naturally mature in their happiness. They become more happy because of maturation, all right? Here's another example of this. Maybe I go out there and say, hey, I think that going to elementary school causes children to lose their teeth. And so what I do is I measure how many teeth you have before school starts, uh, before kindergarten, and then after one year of, of kindergarten, I find out that kids have fewer, uh, fewer teeth than they did before. So I conclude that, um, that going to school makes you have fewer teeth because you know that's what they did. Well, it turns out that kids lose their teeth around the age of six, right? So maturation is a natural change in the group. It's not going to school that changes it. It's actual maturation, it's just a natural change. A history change is an external or historical event that affects most of the group. So for example, when, uh, when COVID happened, that was a historical event that could have changed happiness, for example. So maybe it was that we measured their happiness in January, then COVID happens in March, and right after the last final, we measure happiness again, but all of those people went through uh, remote teaching and COVID and all that stuff, and that could have affected their happiness, an historical external event that might have changed it instead of your manipulation, right? Which wasn't a good manipulation. The last one is called regression to the mean, and regression to the mean means when you look at the first score, that score was just extreme for whatever reason, right? Normally these are just the way historically things happen, all right? Just for whatever reason, people are more extreme uh, on that day. Maybe they just had a really uh, good day that day. Maybe they had a really bad day. So let's think about this in terms of um, where, where we were with happiness and studying. So we think we, we study, we measure happiness at the beginning in January. So what if that group was just kind of randomly all very low in their happiness, okay? A lot lower than average. Maybe uh, they all, I don't know, maybe just different things were happening where they all got sick. Just the confluence of everything means that that group was, for whatever reason, was a lot lower than average. Regression to the means mean means that people's scores on anything are gonna end up closer to the mean naturally. So it could be that just you randomly happen to have caught them at a time when their score is extreme, either low or high, and then over time that's going to change. So for example, if everybody in January was just for whatever random reason low in their score of happiness, and then over time they regress to the mean by the time you get to their final exam, then the change in their happiness is not due to studying, it's due to just you know natural randomness uh, of people getting closer to the mean. The first score was, was extreme and anything else is gonna be much more normal, much closer to the mean. All right, also and within groups designs that happen over time, so multiple testing, you might have attrition. So for example, when we think about this idea of uh, studying causing happiness, remember I measured their happiness first in January and then over the period of time, I, I assume they're studying and then right after finals, they do again. Well, is it, could it be that the people who were least happy at the beginning of January might be the most likely to drop out of school or at least drop out of my study by the time we get out of, by the time we get to the end of finals. Attrition means that there could be dropping out that happens which would affect the overall score of happiness. So if the people who were least happy in January were more likely than the very happy people to, to drop out, then that means that the scores are going to increase because the least happy people are going to drop out. And so the overall score after three months is going to be higher. It's not because of studying, it's because the least happy people dropped out over the course of the semester. 
testing is a problem when you have when you use the same test more than once, right? So let's say that we used uh, happiness on a scale from zero to 10. We did that in January and we did that at the end of the finals. Well, if I did that both times, people might remember what happened. So this is a, this is a form of order effects, right? So it could be that, you know, I just remembered that I scored an eight last time I did this. And, you know, to be consistent, I wanna be a, I wanna say I'm a little bit happier. So I'm gonna say I'm a nine this time, okay? It's not that I actually am happier. I just remembered what happened and the way that you tested me made me change my answer in a specific way. Instrumentation is when the instrument, meaning the test, changes over time. So maybe the way that I gave the test in January was a little bit different than the way that I gave the test in by the end of April. Uh, so what happens is, let's say that uh, in the beginning of January, um, I gave it to gave you the test um, in person, and it was like really cold in the room, for example. And you're like, oh man, and you're not feeling very happy because of the way I gave the test. But because uh, of the change over time, I didn't have a lot of time in, in, in April, so I just send you a little survey, a Qualtrics survey online, and it's really warm outside and things, and you take that and you're feeling happier, right? The, the test has changed over time, right? So the instrumentation, the way the test was done has changed over time. It's not because you were actually happier, it's because the way I changed the test ended up with you changing your answers. And that led me to reject the null hypothesis when I shouldn't have done that. All right, so all of those were problems when, when you have repeated measures, which is normally when you have a within groups design. Okay, so there are other problems with internal validity that happen in all experiments. I don't care if it's independent groups, within groups, all experiments, all experiments. The first one is observer bias, and we've talked about this before. This is also called the Rosenthal effect in certain ways. So if you remember, Rosenthal was the researcher who, who uh, did a lot with self-fulfilling prophecies. And he has a famous study where he uh, went to a elementary school class and he um, gave them an IQ test. And then he randomly put half the kids into a group he called the bloomers and the other half into a group he called the non-bloomers. And he told the teacher, hey, just so you know, Here's your list of bloomers. Here's your list of non-bloomers. These bloomers, even though they might not seem like it right now, we know that within the next within the next school year, they're really going to blossom in their intelligence. They're going to be really good. These non-bloomers, they might seem, you know, pretty ordinary stuff, but we know based off of uh, uh, past research that these really these are really, you know, they're not going to do well. They're really not going to bloom, uh, and you're going to see it in the next within the next year. Now, don't treat them differently, but we thought you should know. Bye bye. See you later. Then at the end of the school year, they came back. Now remember, they put those kids into the bloomer and non-bloomer group randomly. It had nothing to do with any form of intelligence or anything else. It was totally random. They went back, they gave the IQ test again, and guess what? The bloomers scored significantly higher than the non-bloomers. So they go to the teacher and say, hey, you were the only one who knew about this bloomer non-bloomer thing. You didn't treat them any differently, did you? And the teacher says, oh no, I would never do that. So what they found is that the teacher had unwittingly shown a specific form of kind of bias in the way that she inter interacted with the kids. So the bloomers, she would challenge them more, give them extra work, et cetera. The non-bloomers, you know, she wouldn't wait very long for them to, uh, to answer questions because she didn't expect them to. So they didn't work as hard, so they didn't bloom. It wasn't that their actual intelligence was different, it was the way that they were treated that made it happen. So for example, observer bias can happen when the researcher, whoever's or whoever's administering the research, administering the study, their expectations can change the outcome. So if I think that studying harder is gonna make you happier, and I know you've been studying a lot, I might act more happy when I'm around you, and that might make you feel more happy. Or if I know that you haven't studied very much, and when I'm around you, I might act more dour, et cetera, and you might reciprocate, right? because my expectations are making it happen in you. That would be a problem because it's not the actual studying that's make you happy, making you happier, it's the way I interact with you that's making you happy. It would be an observer bias. A placebo effect, I think you know about placebos, but placebo effects can happen in psychology as well as you know, other fields as well. Placebo effect 
is when the participant's expectation, not the researchers, the participant's expectation actually makes it happen. So if I go up to you and I say, hey, we're doing a study, we think that people who study more are going to be happier. You're like, oh, well, I'm studying more, so I'm gonna end up being happier, right? It's your expectation, you, the participant's expectation that actually makes it come true. Like a placebo, just like somebody who's taking a sugar pill, say, oh, I believe this is a headache medicine, and that actually makes it come true. You know? Placebo effect is similar to demand characteristics, but they're not the same thing. In placebo effects, the participant actually believes that the treatment, the manipulation, is really going to have a change in the dependent variable, their happiness, for example. In demand characteristics, they don't actually believe it, but they know that's what you, the researcher, expect them to do. So, for example, if I say, hey, we're doing this, it's about studying, being happy, et cetera, and you're like, oh, it's, I, I didn't study very much. I mean, I don't feel less happy, but, you know, this guy thinks that I shouldn't be happy, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to score a little bit lower, even though I really don't believe that. I'm just going to, you know, just to make this, make this dude happy. Participants change their response because they know the hypothesis. That's what happens with demand characteristics. Not because they believe it, but because they want to mess with the hypothesis, either help you out as a researcher or the opposite could happen, which is they want to totally mess up your results. That is demand characteristics. The way you get rid of these problems is pretty simple. So these problems, these threats to all validity, when you're double blind, then you get rid of these problems. So if the researcher doesn't know what condition you're in, they can't have observer bias. If the participant doesn't know what, what condition they're in, then they're not going to have a then they're not going to have demand characteristics. For the placebo effect, generally what you do is you have a placebo group where they have something where they do something, and so the equal the expectation is equal in both the placebo and the non-placebo group. So generally you don't do, hey, I think uh, you don't like just have a, a normal group and then a group that you make them study, right? You would have everybody do something and you just vary the form of studying to the, the kind that you want. So everybody thinks they're in a treatment group, but there's only one that's actually in the treatment group that you care about. That would be taking care of the placebo effect. All right, for these other threats we've already discussed, when we've got attrition, testing effects, instrumentation, et cetera, most of these can be taken care of uh, when you vary the order in which you're doing the measurements. Now, sometimes that's not easy to do. The other way you can do this is cross-sectional designs. Just don't do it over time. Make sure you do it at the same time and have two separate groups, like, you know, in the independent groups kind of a test. Those would help quite a bit. Also taking care of things like making sure that you uh, do the testing procedure in exactly the correct form. That would help a lot. All right, the next bit of uh, we need to talk about with our problems with null effects, okay? So the, the stuff we talked about so far is problems with internal validity. When you are probably making a type one error, you're saying, hey, I think this is going on when it's really not, okay? These are things that could cause you to have null effects, cause you to make a type two error when you shouldn't have done that, right? So in this particular case, Null effects means that I would find that, oh, there's really no difference between uh, people who study and those who don't study when there really is a difference between those groups. So the ceiling effect and the floor effect have to do with the way you do your measurements. And this is a problem for all studies. It doesn't really matter what the time is, right? If you get null effects, one problem might be ceiling or floor effects. And these are problems with covariance. So what's going on if the ceiling effect is let's say that I measure everybody's happiness uh, and, at, in January and everybody says that they're a nine in happiness. Well, if I measure them again and everybody's a nine again, then everybody's really high. Their, their scores are so high, they all hit the ceiling. I can't find any variance in the difference between people who study and those who don't study. That, that is the problem with ceiling effects. Floor effects is the opposite. Okay, floor effects is the opposite. It's when you don't have uh, you don't have enough variance, but because everybody is saying, oh, everything's super low, right? So if I am looking for, let's think of something that that might uh, indicate a ceiling or floor effect. Now this has to do with the way that you operationalize your measurements, right? The way you do your measurements. So let's say that I go in there and I say, all right, um, tell me. Uh, how happy you are on a scale from 
you know, one to three with one is I'm very miserable. Two is I'm not happy. And three is I'm, I'm happy. Well, that only allows for anybody who feels happy at all to be a three, right? It doesn't allow for any variance. I would get a ceiling effect because everybody's going to give me a three. Even if I manipulate something that actually changes your happiness, my measurement's always going to be a three because people don't like to often say that they're unhappy. Yeah, that would be a ceiling effect. Floor effect is just the opposite. The way you measure, everybody's going to say low. It doesn't matter what manipulation uh, condition that they're in. Whenever we talk about problems with null effects, we need to have the idea of noise. Now, inside of your measurement, you always have the actual thing that you're measuring, right? The actual conceptual variable, but then you have other stuff that's going to change the way, change the score of your measurement. So, for example, if you ask, how happy are you? Then there, when, when somebody actually answers that question, part of that is their actual happiness, but part of it is other stuff that's contributing, like whether or not they should feel socially desirable to say that they're happy, or whether or not they feel pressured, or lots of other things. That's noise. It's extra stuff that changes their um, score, but is not the actual construct. It's not actual happiness. So for example, measurement error. So measurement error happens uh, when, when you're not precise in the way that things are measured, right? So it's pretty common that uh, if you're estimating something, you might estimate a little too high, you might estimate a little too low uh, from what you're actually supposed to measure. That's the measurement error, right? So it's that, it's that fluctuation in the estimate. There's a little bit of error. Well, if you have too much of that, then you're not able to find differences within groups of people, all right? So if there's too much measurement error in the way you produce that measure, there's a problem. So an observational measure is an easy one uh, to, to do, right? So if I am uh, observing you and your actual happiness level would be a seven, but in the way I observe you, it kind of fluctuates. Ah, I might give you some, one person, one observer might give you an eight, another person might give you a six. There's measurement error going on, right? There's fluctuation in the way that your, your measure happens. The less precise the measurement, the, least, the less likely you are to be able to tell um, the difference between two different groups. Individual differences has to do with the individual participants' differences on whatever that happens to be. So for example, if I'm doing within groups design and I have somebody who is just really happy all the time and uh, they, they just are measuring happy, they're happy, they're really, really happy all the time, they're happy, and my manipulation might affect happiness generally, but because I got this really happy person in here, that person's always going to be really high, right? No matter what condition they're in. Whereas somebody else might be really low because of whatever condition they're really in. The individual differences have to do with just differences that happen on that. Now, normally, if you're looking overall in groups and your manipulation is strong enough, you should be able to tell the difference. But it helps if you have a more precise measure uh, so that you can try and, try and you know, parse some of these problems out. Situation noise has to do with the, uh, the atmosphere, the, the, the situation in which somebody is uh, taking their test. So for example, remember we talked about you're taking a happiness measure and you're in a cold room doing a paper pencil, that's situation noise, the coldness of the room, et cetera, that would be situation noise, whatever's going on. So if something loud is happening, if somebody's watching TV, if their roommate is giggling, et cetera, that creates situation noise. It's situation noise because it's not your actual happiness, it's other stuff in the situation you find yourself in that is affecting your score on that particular variable. That is situation noise. One way that you get rid of this, by the way, is to check your manipulation. So you're gonna have problems with null effects. One of the, one of the best ways that you can have problems with null effects is if you don't actually manipulate what you intend to manipulate. So if you do a manipulation check, then you'd be able to tell whether or not you actually manipulated what you intended to manipulate. So let's say that I wanted to test whether studying affects happiness, but instead of doing that pre-test, post-test, one group stuff, right, within groups, let's say that I have 50 people that I, uh, I assign them to study and 50 people that I assign to, um, to watch TV instead. A manipulation check is after I've had them study for 30 minutes or watch TV for 30 minutes. I, I measure, I say, how much did you study? And the people who studied for 30 minutes should say 
that they actually studied more than the people who watch TV, okay? That would be a manipulation check. The better way to think about this is something like stress. Let's say I'm trying to manipulate stress by giving you bad feedback about an exam. So let's say that I say that you fail an exam, that's the high stress condition, or that you got an A plus an exam, that's a low stress condition. After I tell you that, I measure and say, how stressed did you feel? Well, if the people who got an A plus and the people who failed have the same amount of stress, then I haven't manipulated what I intend to manipulate. And therefore, I'm gonna get no effects because I didn't actually manipulate the stress. All right, one last question that we're gonna do. So my hypothesis, study makes you happier, measured everyone happiness in January. Then again, after the last final, I found that they are happier, that people were happier. This study cannot have a problem with null effects. It would not have a problem with null effects because null effects means no effect of studying on happiness. So if I conclude that there's no difference between people who study and those who don't study and their happiness, then that is a null effect. In this case, I found that they're happier. I've already rejected the null. So I could have had a problem with instrumentation or internal validity or attrition. Those are all explanations for internal validity problems, but I cannot have a problem with null effects because I have rejected the null. All right, thanks everybody.